that. And I want to start with a little demonstration. You know, when I sit down at the piano, and my mom should be right around here somewhere. Oh, she's right there, if I just look. <laughs> there are pieces of music that for most of us, we look at something like this. And it looks like chaos. Now, there are other people, such as my lovely mother, who can look at something like this and see something organized and beautiful and can hear it before she even plays it probably a little bit. Now, there is a piece that I love listening to her play. If I look at this particular piece, this is about what it's going to be like. And I'm just going to stop because it's already wrong. <laughs> I look at the music and I'm already having difficulty because I can noodle around on a piano, but I can't sit there and look at music and be able to decipher it well enough. It's always been frustrating to me to try to sight read, but let's hear how it sounds in the hands of a trained professional. That's not the piece you're looking at. <laughs> but it is incredible to me to sit down, and my whole life I grew up listening to this. This particular piece, in fact, I've heard as long as I can remember. And as soon as you start playing that, Mom, my blood pressure goes down. I want you to know that. I love it. It's a blessing to me to hear somebody who can look at I, what I see as chaos that they can make something incredible out of it. It is amazing to me to be able to do stuff like this because if you look at the next slide, this is more like how I feel sometimes. I'll look at the piece, and this is one of my favorite Far Side cartoons, and you see it and you say, look at all the black dots. Whereas a real musician looks at it and says, look at this piece of music. Some of us take a look at our lives and things like this around us, and we feel like it's a bunch of black dots on the page, but yet somehow we need to be able to make sense of it and realize that there is one who is in charge, one who is in charge that not only makes sense of it, but makes it beautiful. Today we are taking a look at Daniel. Daniel actually, as we are starting this series, called Crunch Time. Daniel is one of these books that many people can look at, and it seems like chaos. And yet, I believe as God leads us deeper into the Word, it becomes beautiful and it becomes a word of hope. That's what we're taking a look at right now, and how do we make sense of it when everything seems chaotic in your life, in your family, perhaps in your school, your relationships, in the world around you, at work, at church, wherever you find yourself, even in the world at large that is way out there, sometimes things seem very chaotic. Actually, when we get to Daniel, it, at the very beginning, it's a time of chaos. And in fact, they were warned that it would be like that. If you go back to Deuteronomy 28, 36 through 37, it says there, this is Moses, is, uh, he's speaking to the children of Israel. It's just before they were supposed to start going into the promised land, but they had blessings if they obeyed, but they also had curses if they were to not obey. It says there, the Lord, this is if they were to disobey, of course, the Lord will drive you 
and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or your ancestors. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, and you will become a thing of horror, a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples where the Lord will drive you. When we get to Daniel, you see a people that are driven from their homeland. We see a people who are becoming a byword, a thing of horror. Daniel Daniel actually acknowledged this in one of his prayers further into the book. And it seems like they are surrounded in a time of chaos. And in fact, if you look at the first half of the book, it's basically a bunch of stories, several stories that might seem at the outset to be stories of chaotic situations. And if you look at the second half of the book, it looks like prophecies of potential chaos and chaotic situations where nations are going to be abusing God's people and running over them, and it just seems like nothing is going to make a lot of sense, even though it seems like it's going to get wrapped up in the end. But If you're just looking at it at the surface, it seems fairly chaotic. You come into Daniel and you see a people who are defeated. You see a people who are in exile. They come into Babylon after going into exile. And they are surrounded by a culture and a culture's demands. We find ourselves in such a situation now, don't we? They're surrounded by a culture who was very proud. They're surrounded by people who were conquerors. They were the ones conquered, actually. They are surrounded by people who are even superstitious. It's interesting. When they are taken into Babylon, they're taken to a place where they didn't eliminate the gods of those they conquered. They just assimilated them, actually. So, in other words, that's what we read about, by the way, when... Nebuchadnezzar is taking the vessels of gold and silver out of the house of God in Jerusalem, out of the temple, takes them with him over to the treasury of his God in Babylon. That's what's happening here. It's assimilating. It's their practice of of assimilation. And the people, when they came to Babylon, the Israelites, it's okay for them to worship their God, but Just know that your God was conquered by our God, and now you're part of us. There's assimilation that is going on here. It's making an old culture, a conquered culture, into their culture. We keep reading about these prophecies of chaos and hardship later on in Daniel. The world would have a very unknown future. And it seems, at times, as we're reading through Daniel, it seems like a mess, and it seems like people are surrounded by chaos. It feels, frankly, like you have to wonder who's even in charge here. Maybe you feel sometimes today like you're not sure who's really in charge of the situations around you, because the chaos seems so great and overwhelming that you have to wonder, is there anybody really in charge of this? Am I just going to continue to feel defeated? Well, the prayer today is that Daniel is going to start to give us hope. So the first major point we're going to talk about in Daniel, we read about in Daniel 4. There's two big things. Two, this is a big overarching thing that we'll get more deal details on later. But there's a big overarching picture in Daniel. Two big points. The first one we're going to look at in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a summary of, of it that leads us up to the big point. At the beginning, we discover this is Nebuchadnezzar actually giving his testimony. He's giving his testimony, it says there, first three verses, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. 
His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. This is a testimony. This is a testimony in the first person of the king that conquered God's people. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But hold on. So he has this vision. There's none of the wise men of his nation that can make sense of the vision. Nebuchadnezzar knows from experience that Daniel has the ability to interpret dreams and visions. And so he brings in Daniel. Now, he may have thought that it was his gods that actually kind of gave Daniel's God permission to give Daniel the power to do this because assimilation, that's what you do. But hold on a minute. Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel the vision. Daniel's able to make sense of it. He says there's going to be a tree. It reaches into heaven. It's great. It can be seen throughout the world. It has beautiful leaves. It has abundant fruit that feeds everyone and gives shade to the beasts of the field and homes to the bird of the heaven, birds of the heavens. But it's going to be chopped down. It's going to be destroyed. And the root is going to be left in the ground. The tree is going to be like a like an animal, basically, and it's going to be wet with the dew of heaven, it talks about, and it talks about how it's going to eat grass like an ox, and it's, it's just this bizarre dream that he has. Daniel turns it around and says, in summary, and again, we'll get more into it later, but you are the tree, Nebuchadnezzar. You're the one. You have lifted yourself up. You have made yourself arrogant, basically. You're going to be that tree that gets chopped down, and you're going to act like you're basically an ox. You're going to eat grass. You're going to have your hair wet with the dew of heaven. You're going to lose your mind, Nebuchadnezzar, for seven years until you know that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men. And what happens? Nebuchadnezzar is walking along his roof of his palace one day. Is not this, he says, is not this great Babylon that I have built with my, uh, with my mighty hand and for the glory of my majesty. This arrogant statement. He still hasn't gotten it yet. And at that moment, he's chopped down. It's exactly what happened. He had become great and powerful Now he's chopped down. He's the one that's going to be acting like livestock. He's the one that's eating grass. He's the one wet with the dew of heaven. He's the one whose hair grows as long as eagle's feathers. He's the one whose nails become like a bird's claws. He's also mean in a sense to bless or to praise, but even further, it's to praise or to bless to the uttermost. The way it's written, it's like it's saying to us that Nebuchadnezzar blessed God to the uttermost of his ability to do so. It's like he had got, he basically is praising and blessing God more than he could with anyone else. This is like the highest praise he was even capable of giving. He's giving greater praise now to God, the way this is written than he has ever given to any of his own gods. He has come to a point where he realizes now that God is the true God. This is more than what happened after chapter 1, where he had to kind of acknowledge at least that, yeah, the, the, the diet that the Hebrew boys took on was good, and it was helpful. This is more than after chapter 2 where he had to at least recognize that God had given Daniel the ability to interpret a particular dream in chapter 2. This is more than chapter 3 where he saw the other man in the fire with the Hebrew boys where he acknowledged that God has the power to rescue. Now he is literally saying Daniel's God is really in charge. This is his testimony. This is his conversion moment. And in fact, Ellen White talks about this. He, she wrote in a, uh, in, a, in a statement, in the Review and Herald, January 11, 1906, that Daniel's constant recognition of the God of heaven before kings, princes, and statesmen detracted not one iota from his influence. 
King Nebuchadnezzar, before whom Daniel so often honored the name of God, was finally and thoroughly converted and learned to praise and extol and honor the king of heaven more than he had ever honored or praised or extolled anything before that time. This was the highest form of praise he could possibly give. And it's because Daniel stayed true to his God even when he seemed to be surrounded by chaos. What this teaches us is the first big picture point of Daniel is that God is in charge. No matter how chaotic it seems, no matter how hopeless it seems, in our lives, God is always in charge. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes it seems like we're in a no-win scenario. I used to watch this. Okay, I'm going to get made fun of by my own kids by this one. I used to watch this show called Star Trek. I know, it's embarrassing. But there's this one scene in one of the movies about a ship called the Kobayashi Maru, but it was in a fictional ship. It was a test. During their training, they had to do this test, and basically it was a no-win scenario. It was this situation where they could not possibly get out of it without somebody dying on their crew. There was no way they could win in this case. Well, the captain, Kirk, he decided that I don't believe in a no-win scenario, and so he rigged the test so that when he took it, he was able to get out without anybody dying. Totally cheated, but he didn't believe in a no-win scenario. Now, I realize that it may feel like a stretch to some of us, but I feel sometimes in our lives, even though I can say God is in charge, it feels sometimes like, okay, he's in charge, but I still feel like there's a no-win scenario going on around me all the time. There are things happening that it doesn't seem like he's in charge of this, or if he is, at some point he's going to lose control. And we're not going to get out of this no-win scenario fast enough. So my hope today is, again, that Daniel is going to give us hope that God is in charge, but there's something else he needs to give me. I need to understand that he's not only in charge, but that somehow he's going to win even when the situation is hopeless. So that brings us to Daniel chapter 9. This is the second big picture point of Daniel. And in chapter 9, we see Daniel now is the one giving the testimony. We see a man who is deeply studying Scripture, especially regarding 70 years and the ending of the desolations of Jerusalem. We see a man who is dedicated to serious prayer. We see also a responsive God as God sends Gabriel, the angel, directly to Daniel to answer Daniel's prayers. We see a responsive God that brings us to the second big focal point of Daniel. If you go back to the focal point of Daniel 4, it's the first main focal point. It's God's sovereignty. It's that God is in charge. Here we find the second half focal point of Daniel. And that focal point we can really summarize well in 9, verse 25 to 27. So let's just take that one verse at a time. And verse 25, it says, No one understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed the one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. If we just take that verse by itself, we have to just remember some very... This is going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant for a minute. That's why we're going to come back to this and slow down a little bit. But in biblical reckoning, we remember that in prophetic time, a day equals a year. So we have a seven, so that's clearly a week. So seven sevens, that's 49 years, or days, so day to year, so we get 49 years from that. Then there's a 62 seven, so there's another 62 there. Uh, Of course, times seven, that's 434. Uh, Then we have another one. That gets us to, to, you know... We have one more week after that, another seven years, totally 40 and 490 years in this prophecy, just to summarize. This is just a very quick overview. 
This word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That likely comes about 457 B.C. And it's important to remember something here. Anointed one means Messiah. Anointed one means Messiah. And if you remember, there's no zero year. If we count forward, it, we come to AD 27 when Jesus was baptized. You know, to the Walton boys that were baptized today, remember, Jesus did it first. And it's a blessing that to see you be a part of that today. When we come to that year, we come to Jesus three and a half years later being crucified. If we just keep this in mind for a moment, we go to verse 26. After 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. He's not going to have anything. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. So what Gabriel is revealing here is that in the middle of the 70th week, the anointed one would be cut off and have nothing. And it's three and a half years, again, after Jesus starts his ministry. He's put to death. About three and a half years after he's put on a cross, uh, actually comes the end of that whole prophecy when Stephen was stoned. K Gabriel keeps going. Verse 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, there was a veil in the temple that tore in two. We know at that time, the sacrificial system of the Hebrews was done, was done away with and was null and void because Jesus died on the cross. Amen. And that's all talked about in Daniel but really the bigger point that we're coming to here, and there's a whole lot of other points we could make that would take us into well into the afternoon, but the biggest point here that we're sufficing to say is not only is God in charge, but at the cross, God wins. Amen. The anointed one dies, and that's another big part of this whole story is we're surrounded by chaos and seeming defeat, and in all of this, God is still in charge, and God still wins. Amen. When it seems like he's losing, he's winning. Amen. God is in charge, and God wins. He is sovereign, and he is victorious. Those are the two big points of hope we find in Daniel. And if you remember nothing else from Daniel except those two points, God is in charge and God wins, it helps us make sense of the chaos. Those are the big points of hope that we find. And it leads me to what I need. It leads me to what we all need. To believe that God is in charge. Amen. To trust God with our very lives and to claim his victory Amen. at the cross for each and every one of us. Amen. So that's really what we're appealing for you today. To embrace the two big points of Daniel for you. And really what it boils down to is, is he your Lord and is he your Savior? Is he sovereign in your life, and is he victorious? Is he in charge, and is his victory your victory? I want to ask mom if you come up for just a minute, because all of the victory boils down to this whole thing of Jesus loves me. I wonder if today God is your Lord and your Savior. Today is a chance before we go to this song. I want to give you a moment just as mom's playing. This is my appeal. This isn't a big come forward moment. I just, in silence, going to give each of you a chance in prayer to accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. To believe and embrace that God is in charge and God is victorious in your own life. 
Just take a few minutes as this is playing, and as we continue to walk through Daniel, never forget those two big points. God is in charge, and God wins. May you accept this today as you hear these, this music in your own prayers. Oh God, be our Lord, be our Savior. I acknowledge that you are king and sovereign and you are in charge and you are victorious at the cross of Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. I claim that and I pray over everyone here that we also together claim that. We love you. May we cling to the hope that Daniel has given us. May we cling to Jesus, and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for worshiping with us today.
Please go be the church this week.